In value chain analysis, we have five primary activities. We have inbound logistics. How are we handling inputs? Operations, what do we do to take those inputs to a product and service? Outbound logistics, collect, store, distribute the product service to the buyers. Market and sales, means incentives for buyers to buy the product and service. How do we maintain the value of the product service? So in the value chain, we basically have the four activities that support this. The organizational infrastructure, human resources management, technology development, and procurement. And basically, all we're saying here is that we want to analyze how the raw inputs or how our products come uh, from the inputs. What needs to get done to them? And how is the technology actually going to change that or if make that more efficient so that we can deliver it to our competitors, uh, to, I'm sorry, to our customers? Remember, we talked about IT adding value. So at each one of the stages, we should see how IT adds significant value to the business. Um, the virtual value chains are uh, market spaces where information substitutes for the physical. So you still have a value chain when you're producing an ebook. You still have a value chain when you're producing online music. You still have a value chain for internet radio. The difference is there's no tangible product. And here's the, the chart in figure 4.7, uh, which I'm sure all of you have seen. Uh, again, this isn't used as widely, but it's something you should be aware of as a potential planning uh, activity. The e-business value matrix basically is used by Cisco, and basically it's, it's difficult for a lot of businesses to prioritize projects. But what they do, and a lot of companies kind of try and do this, they basically categorize um, the assets and its value to the company, whether it's something that's new, new fundamentals, uh, operational excellence, rational experimentation, or breakthrough strategy. What they're trying to do is identify each project and see how it fits within the organization's long-term or short-term goals, and whether it's something they want to do. Um, one of the ways that you can actually uh, reference this is there's a, a planning analysis called Moscow Analysis, M, even though it's spelled M-O-S-C-O-W, it's M-S-C-W. Must-haves, should-haves, could-haves, and wants. And this is, this is very much what that is. What must we have in place to either stay competitive or to remain competitive? What should we have? What could we have? And then what would be nice to have? And you'll see a lot of executives kind of use that type of method as well. Um, in new fundamentals, the criticality to the business is low. Newness of idea is low. But if you go on a breakthrough strategy, we now go on the, on the dimensions, both dimensions is high. Should be fairly straightforward. In linkage analysis, examines the links between organizations have uh, with one another with the goal of creating a strategy for utilizing electronic channels. Basically, the analysis says, we're trying to see how we can leverage our network connectivity or our connectivity to other organizations for the purposes of increasing value. And basically, you have uh, defined the power relationships among the various players, identify who has the power, determine future threats and opportunities for the company. Who can come in and establish a new electronic relationship that would basically beat us out of the market? Or is there a way that we can establish a relationship with somebody to prevent other players from doing it? And so you see this linkage analysis used, but it's usually used on a project by project basis. Um, it's, it's really not as widely used either. This is just one of those ones that are occasionally used depending on the, uh, depending on the industry itself or the company itself. But you plan, to, plan your electronic channels to deliver information components of products and services. Um, and how these are linked to the suppliers and buyers is really dependent on the industry. The extended enterprise basically focuses on the fact that we have top management, middle management, operations, electronic channels, and then a whole bunch of other external entities. We could simplify this a little bit and say you have internal stakeholders and external stakeholders. The internal stakeholders would be the top three parts of this pyramid. The electronic channels are the means by which we communicate with external stakeholders, which are at the bottom. In some of the enterprise architecture analysis, and there's a PDF slide that actually shows this, um, a separate module, or part of module, uh, you will see how we look at that from an enterprise architecture as part of the overall business architecture. And it basically shows the, the difference between the internal stakeholders and the external stakeholders and the information flow between them. In scenario planning, what we focus on is the stories about how the world might be in the future. We basically get everybody together and we define a problem. And we, uh, we have a time frame to bound the analysis. We say we, we need to finish this in a week or two weeks. We identify the major known trends that are going to affect the decision and then identify some uncertainties and then everybody begins to develop scenarios. Now this works well, but it works well in certain cases. The best scenario planning occurs in disaster recovery. That's one of the disaster recovery, cybersecurity, those are probably some of the key areas that you will see scenario planning work and work very well. And what they do is, you know, you look at the value of the, uh, of the resource, 
versus the form uh, of interorganization or organization uh, coordination. And sometimes this is overlaid with a risk management model where we basically identify the probability of an event versus the impact of an event across the same two dimensions. So in conclusion, IS plans have to look towards the future. Um, the future is not likely to be an extrapolation of the past, um, even though in some cases it is. It basically, like the business models that we talked about, uh, from uh, the economy ultimately doesn't change. People buy and sell products and you still have to make a profit. Um, but in terms of how we do business, we might actually change that. Uh, social media will change things. The internet changed things. Even though the core fundamentals were still the same. Successful planning needs to support peering into the future. We need to have an idea in kind of like a sense and response. And it has to be intrinsic to business planning. It can't be done in a silo. So when we put all of this together, we're basically saying that IS has to look into the future, but it has to be careful about how it does that not necessarily ignoring the lessons of the past, but ensuring that it's working with the business to provide a solid plan or solid five-year plan with a set of uh, portfolios which have a set of projects uh, for the organization. So that concludes this section, and we'll see you for the next one. Oh, I forgot a slide, I'm sorry. Um, IS typically does use a combination of the planning techniques. Census response is the one that's uh, strategy-making mood uh, mode. Uh, which planning methods do you think are better for your company? What are some of the major flaws in your preferred method? Uh, how would you suggest any changes? So I guess you can go on a blackboard and think about the different planning methods and how they might work in your industry or company. And what are some of the flaws that you think are in your method? Like when would it work, when would it not work? And would you suggest any changes that might be appropriate for your company? So we'll see you for the next module.